morning. morning. Scripture reading this morning will be taken from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you were once in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Well, it's great to see you guys again. I keep meeting new people all the time. I haven't seen them for a whole year, and... uh, it's great to see everybody coming back and being able to renew some friendships that way. And so it's especially good to meet new old people. I guess that's the way to say that. So we want to talk a little bit about grace today and about what grace means, but specifically about the cost of grace. And if you ever hear the term grace, you tend to think that Well, grace is something that's free because that's what's always emphasized. And so, first thing you want to know is, this title is wrong. What do you mean the cost of grace? Grace is always free. We understand that. Grace has got to be free, doesn't it? But I want us to look at that a little bit today. What does free grace cost? Oh, wait a second. (laughs) All right, so let's look at the passage that... uh, Troy has just read to us because this is perhaps one of the main passages that talks specifically about grace and about what it means. And so he begins this passage by saying, you were dead in trespasses and sin. You were part of a very bad, difficult, evil world. You were not in a good place. You were captured by the prince of the power of the air. You were dead in your passions, in your flesh, carrying out the desires of your body and your mind. You had no control over yourself. You were just doing the whatever felt good, and whatever felt good is what drives us. But it doesn't always get us to the place we want to go. In fact, it usually gets us in trouble when we start just doing, well, I'm going to do whatever I feel like it. And that's the sure sign that this day is going to go bad. Because if you start doing whatever you feel like, somewhere along the way, it's going to explode on you. Because you're probably going to get in trouble with somebody else. But then he comes to this section, he says, but God was rich in mercy. But God had grace. And so he says, we were made alive with Christ. We have been saved by grace. And please do not take away anything from this. That is absolutely the case. We have been saved by grace. It's a free gift. Gifts are always free. If they charge you shipping for your free gift, it is not a free gift. Gifts are always free, and that's what he's saying here. It was free. It is not cheap. And hopefully you can see the difference in those things. We were raised up with Christ. We were seated in heavenly places. We were given a spiritual life. We are given places in heaven that, and I love this phrase, the surpassing riches of grace might be given to us. 
the riches of grace, the value, the expense of grace. And so all of these are descriptive terms to talk about how valuable, how important this is. And so we have been saved by grace. So that is totally from God. He's the only one that could do that. He's the only one that can bring that about. There's no boasting. There's no reason for us to say that, well, we're good enough. Uh, that's not the point. It all comes from God. It is absolutely 100% from God. And so it is given to us as a gift. I'm going to assume sometime in your life you got a gift, right? There was a gift that was given to you. Everybody's had a gift, right? All right, some of you I'm not so sure about. Have you, did you ever have a birthday or anything? So we're given a gift, and we hold on to that gift and say, wow, this looks so pretty. It's got a purple ribbon. It looks great. Thank you. And we set it down, and we walk off, and we leave it. Because what we got was the gift. You didn't have to open it, did you? Because that would require effort. That would make us have to do something with the gift that we got. But that's kind of the whole point of it. God gives us this gift. It's like getting the new bicycle for your birthday, but then do you have to ride it? You know, sometimes when you have to pedal, that gets hard, right? Or you got the gift, but we're not going to open the package. Are you kidding me? No, that's the only way that a gift makes any sense whatsoever at all, is if it becomes something that's useful. And God didn't give us something like grace that is not useful. The riches of such extravagant grace are absolutely useful for us. And so we open the package when we are baptized into Christ, and we are able to have this great gift. And as we apply the blood of Jesus to our sins and those sins are taken away. What an amazing thing that that is. And how we are able to have that and how we are able to see that. When you look at grace, there's a lot of definitions. It's goodwill. It's loving kindness. It's unmerited divine assistance, divine assistance given to humans for their regeneration or sanctification. Yeah, that sounds like a church definition, doesn't it? It's a free gift. It is something that we have. It has influence on our souls. It turns us into Christ. Well, how far does this gift go? Well, the amazing part of this is this gift is given to everybody. When we look at Titus chapter 2 and verse 11... He says, for, there, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great Savior, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Amazing passage. So grace has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. How many is all? All people. That means every single person. Every single person in the whole earth has had salvation and grace extended to them. So why aren't all people saved? If every single person has the grace of God extended to them, why do we have some people that are just really horrible and ornery? And it seems like they never got any grace at all because they certainly don't live like that. And when we begin to look at it, we realize that, you know what, the salvation or the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, but 
all people didn't open the gift. All people didn't open the gift. They didn't get what it was. There was no response. They didn't do anything with it. They just simply said, okay, I... And, and if there's no response, then it doesn't do you any good. There's no salvation that actually occurs. It's there, but it doesn't occur. And it is instructing us or teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly desire and to move into a different world to move into a place of holiness to move into a different way to live responsibly righteously godly well what yeah that if we have this grace of god and if this grace of god is given to us then jesus has redeemed us from our sinful deeds and that we are purified as a people for his possession and that we are zealous for good works and that we have become someone different and how great this is to realize that this grace is given to all people and those who take advantage of it have this huge difference in their life have you ever had somebody give you a new car yeah me either and we're not giving away one today, just so you know. But what would the, that be like? What would you do if somebody just handed you the keys and says, this is yours? You see that sometimes. You know, parents still do that to their child and say, here's the keys. Yeah, we didn't do that. We said, here's the job. <laughs> And as soon as you make enough money, we'll go shopping for the car. And... But what would you treat the car like? Because there's stuff you have to do with the car. You realize you have to put gas in it. Well, what do you mean I have to put gas in it? Aren't you going to pay for that? You have to get insurance. For you, for the car, for everything. You have to change the oil sometimes. If you just drive it and never change the oil, well, then it's not going to work so well. And so the way you treat the car depends on how you think of the person who gave it to you. Is it a valuable gift or is it not a valuable gift? Is it just something, well, somebody gave me this and uh, I'll use it till it falls apart, which is about two weeks. <laughs> okay? What happened? Well, I don't know. And you just walk and say, oh, well, maybe they'll give me another one. No. The person who treats that gift as if it is something precious and something important, that can last them for a very long time. But it depends on how you treat it. If we treat it and there's a lot of appreciation for it, then we can understand the value of it. But we can also just tear it up. And go, we don't care. It didn't cost us anything. Who cares? Well, we will after we've walked for a while. And that's what happens. Jesus draws a story where he talks about basically two different worlds. And he uses forgiveness to teach this principle of grace. We live in a world where we start out with everything is fair. And that's a lot of what people assume. I think the world is a fair place. There should be justice. You ought to pay what you owe. Everything works out even. It's always a good thing. Back in their time, it was eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As long as you do everything good, it's all going to go well. When you don't do things good, it won't go well. We call that karma. Stuff comes to get you, and we believe in all that kind of stuff. But that's not God. And if we want to live in that kind of a world, if you do right, you'll get rewarded. If you don't do right, well, you'll get some things happening. It's what most movies are based on, because the idea is that we can do things that are right, and we can do things that are good, and if something doesn't come out with fair, then we get revenge. Revenge is the underlying motive for almost every movie that you're going to see. 
It's not necessarily about what's right or good because now we get to have revenge and we can be the people who, and just fill in the rest of the movie with whichever one you like. We get even, as if somehow that's a good thing to have. The prodigal thought that. He could make it in that world. He could take his inheritance. He could walk out into that world, and he had it all figured out. But the story Jesus tells is a little bit of a different story. And we need to be aware of this story and how God sees us. And so in Matthew chapter 18, verse 23, he says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven will be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of, the, of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. And so Jesus uses the concept of forgiveness to explain what grace is about. This is a passage about grace. One so, servant owed 10,000 talents. Okay, well, how much would that be in time? Well, a talent is actually a weight. And so it's usually talking about money. And if you had 10,000 talents of gold, it's going to be significant. $11.9 billion. How long will it take you to pay that back? How much per month would you have to pay? It's only 100000 a month, right? Well, and the guy says, have patience with me and I will pay you. He's lying. There is no possible way, it doesn't matter how much you're pay, you make, that you're ever going to pay $11.9 billion back to somebody. At least not in your lifetime. But we get that fairness thing, okay, something, after all, he wrecked the car and there had to be insurance issues and, you know, whatever it is that has caused him to run up this amount of debt, he says, and it's Jesus' principle in the story, $11.9 billion. Now, if it's silver talents, it comes down a lot in price. It's only $161 million. And so how long would it take you to pay $161 million back? Yeah, still impossible. For what most of us make, you could take all of our salary, 100% of it, and we're never going to get there. We're never going to be able to pay back the debt. And that's the whole point. The guy's lying. I'll, I'll pay it. No, he won't. You have no chance to ever pay that back. And the man forgives him, releases the debt. This is mercy. He doesn't get punished like he should have been. This was a common practice during this time. Well, then, you know, if you don't have the money, then I'll sell you and your wife and your kids, and I'll just take everything you've got and you and will settle for whatever we can get. Rather than that, he releases all of it. It's grace because he gets something he doesn't deserve. He gets forgiveness. And so now he's completely able to be free of this, and this moves him into a different world. It's a world of kindness. It's a world where there's something that is different from before. Everything is not fair. Now it's more about grace and about mercy and about love than it ever was before. And we're able to get people in their best. And so Jesus' first introduction to the story is the kingdom of heaven is like this other world where these things exist, where debt can be completely erased, where sins can be completely forgiven, but where people are expected to do better. 
they can become more. They can take the chance to start all over again, and they can become better than they ever were. And appreciation is expected, and forgiveness is given, and people love each other and care about each other, because if you were given a second chance, you would do it better, wouldn't you? I mean, most of us think, especially if we got an $11.9 billion debt, I think I would be doing better the next time and not get in that situation. But the story continues that Jesus tells. And so he says, but when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii and he seized him and he began to choke him saying, pay what you owe. So his servant fellow fell down and pleaded with him. Have patience with me, and I will pay you. And he refused, and he went, and he put him in prison until he should pay the debt. Well, it's pretty hard to pay a debt from prison, isn't it? You're not getting much on the prison job. He's not acting like he got moved to this other world. He's not acting like it's another place. In fact, he's acting like, the first one, like world number one, which is, it's all about me. It's all about me and whatever I want, whatever's fair for me. And so he doesn't act like he's been forgiven. Now, it's a hundred denarii, which is a significant debt. Transfer that today. I have to make sure somebody else did this. $87,000. No, $8,700, excuse me, 100 denarii equivalent today, $8,700. Well, that's a lot, right? That's more than your tax return. It's bigger than your stimulus. But it might be possible to pay that back if you have enough years. It's cheaper than your car, right? You can't buy one for that. But when we start looking at this, yeah, that's, that might be possible. But this guy has no patience with that. He doesn't see that. He's just, no, I want my money. I want it now. And he wants to live in the other world like he's still in the first one. It's all about me, and I can get whatever I want. And I can. And maybe he feels like he'll get ahead that way, and maybe he thinks he can do better that way. Doesn't that just aggravate you? Well, it aggravated the other servants who were there too. And so they went and told the master, uh, guess what's going on? This guy got all the forgiveness of $11.9 billion and he's fighting over this a little bit. He's acting like he's in world number one. He's angry, he's demanding, and there's no grace. There is no forgiveness. There is no mercy. Well, I imagine you know the story. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, the master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. And the story just got a lot more personal. The master says, fine, we'll go back to world number one. And you will move back there. He calls him wicked. What did he do? How could he possibly be wicked? Did he do anything wrong? He's just getting what's owed him. That's all he's doing. It's fair. It's logical. It's legal. And if you can make it fair and logical and legal, then it's okay, right? Not if you want God's grace. Because that system is not fair. You don't get what you deserve. It is not logical that God would send his son. And it is not something we deserve. 
And so our response needs to be something different. And what he's saying is you act like you're in world number one. It's all about me. He says, I forgave your debt and you didn't forgive others. So he sends him back to his first world. And grace is taken away. And there is no mercy. Why? Because he didn't live there. It didn't make a difference in his life. Even though he had the gift, even though he was forgiven, this is possibly the most disturbing scripture that there is. Because you realize what this says. That if we don't let grace into our life, into our heart, into where we forgive and we are gracious people, God can take grace back. Did you ever think that's possible? No, you forgave us, God. We got the promise. You forgave us. And I expected you to act like it. And when we don't act like it, he says, then I'll just take it back. If you want to live in the me world, I'll let you live in the me world. Now, is God going to take back your salvation? Absolutely not. He is not because you're going to respond to him. You're going to love God the way he loves you. You're going to love other people that way. And you're not going to be like this guy who is forgiven of so much and then gets angry with everybody and demands that the world be right and logical and legal and fair rather than gracious and merciful and loving. And, and so we're not going to go back there because we're not going to let those things. Grace is perhaps the most expensive thing you will ever have because it is free and it requires your life. If we insist on saying in world number one, we can stay there. Grace makes demands on how we treat others. It demands forgiveness for forgiveness. It's not just about baptism. You can get baptized and make the new covenant, but by all means realize the covenant that you made with a gracious God who will now forgive every single sin that you have ever committed, and that makes you a person of grace who will also do that for others. Grace always demands a response because grace always costs more than anything else. So what does real grace cost God? It cost God his son. It was more expensive than all of creation, more than the whole earth. It's the cost of being divine, that Jesus would leave that and come to this earth to die for us. It is the cost of heavenly places. It is the cost of God dying on a cross. It is the cost of horror, the cost of shame. It is the cost of humiliation. It is a loss of holiness. It is a loss of glory. And it cost Jesus all of that, and he became sin, and it killed him. What does it cost us? Well, what does it cost to be a saint? There is the response of faith and baptism, but that's really not a cost. I'm sorry, nobody's paying you for that. That's not a value that you have. Just try that with somebody when the bill collector comes around. Just say to him, I'll be baptized for you, right? That would settle it all up. I don't think that's really a good way. 
what it costs us is giving up ourself, our will, our earthly life. It's a response in worship to God. It's a response in service to God because we are created for good works. And so how do you respond to expensive things? How do we think about expensive things? Well, Jesus talks about the pearl of great price and about the one who looks and finds the most precious pearl and he sells everything and buys that because now he has something of great value or the treasure in a field and he goes and buys the whole field just so he can have the treasure. It's one of those amazing things that we would treat God's grace as so valuable, as so precious. And there is one story that happens toward the end of Jesus' life that I wanted to share with you as we close about this. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus had been Jesus' great friends. And he had gone to Bethany a lot of times and stayed with them and eaten dinner with them, and they are special people to him. And he has gone and sat and taught. And you remember the passage with Martha where Jesus is teaching there and Martha's in the kitchen fixing dinner and Mary is not helping and she gets so frustrated and so upset. And she comes running in and says, tell my sister to help me. And Jesus says, no. Um, why don't you sit down? We're doing something important here. Well, that's got to be really frustrating, but that was the story, and that's kind of a confrontation, and they are also the ones where Lazarus is able to be the object lesson, but not just in a little bit of an object lesson, not just the fact that, okay, you had, you know, a disease, and now we've healed you of COVID. No. He died, and he's dead four days. And all of the mourning that goes on. And Jesus walks in and says, Lazarus, come out. He's already in the tomb. Already been buried. That is a close relationship when you say, all right, we'll do the funeral for you. Just so you can teach a point that you are the resurrection and the life. I mean, that is a really close relationship. And so we see them coming to six days before Passover in John chapter 12. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the, death, from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. And Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. And Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have, but you do not, for the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. And so six days before the Passover, five days until his death because he dies on the day of preparation for Passover. And this maybe just helps you see they're going to have a dinner for him and there's a lot of other people invited, but it seems like Jesus might be the guest of honor that's there. And if this passage is linked with Mark 14, then perhaps Simon the leper is also there. And they are the ones who are guests. Martha's the one preparing food because that's Martha. She's always the one preparing food. And guess what? Mary isn't helping. Mary's part is she comes in with the family savings. 
it's all been put into this alabaster box. And this alabaster box is full of perfume. It's pure nard. And you would sometimes put this as people came in because they didn't have deodorant and they kind of stink. And you'd, so you'd say, take a little bit of this and, you know, put it behind your ear like women do so that you don't stink so bad. Some of us, we might have to just put it on our nose so that, you know, we're the ones. But that's what they would do with this. But they've got a whole pound of this. It is worth a whole year's wages. 300 denarii. Mark says it's a year's wages. And so as you look at this, it's the most expensive thing that they could own. It's like emptying all the stock accounts and saying, all right, here, Jesus. And she takes this and she breaks the box. And she begins to anoint his feet. And it fills the room and she wipes his feet with her hair. And you don't let down your hair in public. Not if you're a woman back then. That was always put up, but she lets down her hair in public and may suffer the ridicule. It's an intense love. It's an intense surrender to Jesus. This is everything I have. Every ounce of money that we've got, this is everything. It is the most valuable, valuable possession, and she just pours it all out. You can't put it back in. And it's all on Jesus. And in Mark's version, the people are yelling at her. They're like, what are you doing this isn't right. It just takes, a, but she broke the box and said, no, it's all on Jesus. And Judas perhaps says what everybody else is thinking. Wow, that was way too expensive. We could have, and he's thinking about himself, you know, that me world. We could have gotten that in and saved some of the poor and at least helped them. And Jesus is not against helping the poor. He said, but that's going to be an ongoing thing. They're not going to go away. They will always be there. And Mary is trying to tell you something. That you would really take what's the most precious thing for you and just give it to Jesus. And so what does grace demand of us? What is the response to a personal Savior? Let me suggest the price of grace is not about how much you get for the price. It is about how much we respond to the giver. Isn't that what you wanted when you handed your kid the keys to the new car? I didn't want them to just be excited about the car and drive off. I wanted them to be excited about the person who's giving them the car. I, I wanted them to be excited about the one who's done all of this and provided all this for them. Forgiveness is the divine miracle of grace. The cost to God was the cross of Christ. And so what's our response to a cross? Well, first, baptism, because we're able to make a covenant with him. And second, worship, because you're here this morning and you realize that this is important. And you've taken time out of your week to be able to come and just say, and that's exactly what God wanted. You got the gift, and now you've come back to say thank you. And that's what worship is, is being able to say, we have this incredible gift of forgiveness, God, and we, we struggle to forgive everybody else, but we're trying to do that, and we want you to know how much we appreciate it. And so we sing songs of praise, and we do things for other people. We are filled with service for you. And I know some people want to break it all down to what's logical and technical, and what says, well, you can't tell me I have to do anything. 
Because after all, if grace is free and God's given it to me, then it's already paid for everything. What's the minimum I have to do to get in? Well, I think you've missed the point of grace. And are you asking what's the minimum I have to do before he takes it back again? Is that really the question you wanted to ask? What do we do because of grace? Do we have to go to church? You guys have already answered that. Do I have to pray? Can't he just give me things without my asking? He knows what I need and he'll just fill everything. Do I have to give back? Do I have to be involved? Do I have to change my life? Can't I just live in world number one and do everything about me and God, you will just fund it? No. He makes our life more full. He makes our life more holy. He makes our life happier. He makes us forgiven. He makes us part of each other. He makes us love and have grace with each other. Wow. He gives you a whole new world, not just one that has been full of sin, where people have turned into just being as, as difficult with each other as possible, but into a whole new world that is loving and caring. And so how would you respond to grace? Which world do you want to live in? The first respond is baptism. He makes that covenant. It's the way you unwrap the gift. It's the keys to the car. It's breaking the box. What do you need to do this morning to respond back to a God who gives you life? Let me suggest we start by singing. And if you need anything else, we're here to help you with that. Would you come while we stand and sing? Thank you.